as we look at Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13 for this evening. Now, when Job's three friends heard of this adversity that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize Job, they raised their voices and wept, and each of them tore his robe, and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with Job for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word to Job For they saw that his pain was very great. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father God, as we come tonight, as we look at these verses, and Father, we uh, began to try to search out the meanings that you would have us to take, the meanings you would have us to apply to our lives from this Old Testament story that perhaps is the oldest book in all the Bible. God, I pray that you would help us this evening to remember that the most important thing for us in this present life is to know that you, the anchor, holds in spite of the storms, in spite of the challenges, in spite of our misunderstandings, and Father, in spite of all of our questions that beg for answers when answers aren't enough we know there's Jesus. So tonight as we pause in gratitude and praise and thanks, I pray, oh God, you would speak to our hearts through your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, for the last uh, two or three Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, we've been looking at some advice from the book of Job about wives. And then this past Wednesday evening, we looked at advice Uh, to husbands. Tonight we're going to look at the three original friends here. Word certainly has gotten out that uh, there's been a calamity, a tragedy, uh, an unfortunate mishap in the life of Job and Job's wife. Job was so well known in the East in that period of time that he obviously had many friends, but we are told about three here in this particular passage later on there'll be a fourth friend that will arise he will be much younger than these three but not all of the friends of Job showed up we don't know too much about these three friends who came to be with Job we're not really sure where uh, they originally uh, lived they're simply called Job's friends Now, their names were Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. And when we get to chapter 32, there'll be a fourth friend that arrives on the scene, stage left. His name will be Elihu. And when he enters the story, he's much younger. He admits that he is shy. You and I would probably say he would be more introverted. So he stays in the shadows out there for quite some time. There are three separate dialogues of uh, conversation that occur between Job and these three original friends as the fourth one, Elihu, will stay quiet. But the first three friends are anything but quiet as they, after the seven days of silence, after that, they will unload a truck of criticism, guilt, shame and blame upon Job himself. We will hear from these friends as we make our trek through chapters 3 and following. And uh, these three older friends were closer to Job's age. They were probably, perhaps, wealthy sheiks of that day who had time, who had money to be able to leave their homes and whatever positions they may have been in whatever their businesses were in order to come and to be with Job. Perhaps they met Job somewhere out there in the business world. We don't know. We are just surmising various places that they could have met him. We're not told how the friendships formed. The point is that each one came from his own place to spend time in this crucible with their friend Job. Now, 
Wednesday night we spoke about a crucible is a cross that you and I carry in our lives, whatever the situation is, whatever the crucible is that we are caught up in uh, at the moment. And this story unfolds, and these make an appointment together. Now, they come for two reasons to be with their friend Job. They come, first of all, to sympathize with him, and secondly, they come to comfort him You and I will see as we make our way through these chapters that after that seven days of silence, which was customary for them in that day as they sat totally in silence, can you imagine sitting in silence for seven days in the presence of your friend and not saying one word? I mean, that's almost virtually impossible, isn't it, to even consider and to think about But keep in mind, it will be easy to forget when you begin to hear each one of them speak and the things that they say uh, to Job. Now, before we complete the book of Job, there's going to be a lot of unattractive, there's going to be a lot of unpleasant things that are going to be said by these three friends. Matter of fact, the longer they stay, the worse things get. The more argumentative they are, the more judgmental they are, and the more intense becomes the dialogue. Now, while you and I would agree that it is commendable, these men came, at least, at least they did show up, while others didn't. They're coming, and their stated reason for coming gives you and me a choice, an opportunity, as we appraise the kind of friendship that they had. We have so far looked at some advice to husbands and wives, and tonight we're going to focus on advice from friends. What do you do? What kind of characteristics do you expect out of your friends when the going gets tough? Toby sang a few moments ago, the anchor holes were it not for the anchor, the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I would not have an anchor to hold on to when times, tumultuous times, come in life, when times come that we cannot understand. Let's look at some advice this evening for friends. Number one, friends care enough to come without being asked to come. Friends care enough, true friends care enough to come without being asked to come. Now, no one sent a message to Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. Nobody sent them uh, an invitation. Uh, Would they please come and uh, spread some sympathy and comfort uh, to Job and Mrs. Job? You see, the man is dying in this crucible, uh, this incredible anguish of pain with all of these Uh, boils that have infested his body and uh, it wasn't necessary so much that the true friends show up but they showed up because they loved Job or it seemed that they loved Job and so Job is hurting Job is in despair and these friends come they don't need an official invitation they just spontaneously come when they hear the news about what's happened in his life. Remember the New Testament story of Lazarus? Do you remember when Lazarus got sick? Curtis sings that song, when he's three days late, he's always on time. If you'll remember, Lazarus got sick. He was a friend of Jesus. Jesus spent lots of time down there in Bethany at Lazarus and Mary and Martha's house. Lazarus was sick. Jesus was was away. He was somewhere else. And Mary and Martha... Uh, they let Jesus know about that. In fact, when Jesus came, the one whom, who loved you is sick. That's primarily what they said. They didn't ask Jesus to come, and when he didn't come, then they were offended. But he could have said, you never asked me to come. You don't have to ask a friend, do you? Let me ask you a question. I want you to think in your heart right now, when a friend of yours truly offended you through some tragedy, through some trial, through some crucible, through something that was going on in your life, I want you to think about that. I've always, the the various different things 
throughout my career in ministry, I have often thought about, Paul, I'm sure that, that you being in ministry with Jerry, I'm sure there were many times that you and he have thought about these things as well. But there are times in ministry that you go through various things. Staff members can identify with this. That you go through various things. Some people are much more guarded with expressing what's taking place in their life. I, I mentioned this morning the song the choir did so beautifully singing, Bow the Knee. I can remember that particular crucible, that particular moment in my life of something I was experiencing. And uh, that song became my friend, Ken. That song became a ministry to me in my mind, in my ears. Uh, the recording of that would play over and over and over and over, and I held on to that till I got through that particular crucible in my life. And I have noticed that down through the years of 40 years of ministry, that it seems like when I needed it the most, God always sent a song. Now, I'm confident of the fact that we all love music. I'm confident of the fact that many people say a, a song will speak to me more than a message, than a sermon. And while that may be true, God's Word should always speak to us. And so even in stating things like that, we need to be cautious and conscientious that, yes, God is the author of music and the Holy Spirit moves upon lives to pen words, but... We need to be careful because the Word of God is what is important. Now, in those songs, uh, hopefully the Word of God is in that. But I have noticed down through the years particular songs. Uh, Ken, sometime if you can find a song that, that uh, uh, 20 years ago was a song that God put in my heart and life, and that was when mercy called me by name. His mercy called me by name. Terry Talbert, who was the pastor at Gatlin Baptist Church at that time, Terry's wife, sang that song. And uh, I never forgot the first time I heard that song uh, when, when mercy called me, uh, or mercy called me by name, I think is the name of that. I don't even know if it's still possible to get out there. But I can still hear her singing that song. And uh, several were the times that I would have her to sing that song in particular. And there's something about music that, that lifts our spirits in moments and periods of despond or distress. We sing that song in seasons of distress and grief. My soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Now, we're looking tonight at friends. What are friends supposed to do? How are friends supposed to respond? And I oftentimes hear people in counseling situations where they are offended because the friend did not do something that they expected the friend to do. I'm sure that as Mary and Martha, as they were disappointed that Jesus didn't come when he had gotten word that Lazarus was sick. But I want you to think about it. There was a greater cause behind why Jesus did not come immediately. Jesus knew if he showed up immediately, then it would not be the picture of the resurrection from the dead to life. Jesus would be on his way to the city of Jerusalem for Palm Sunday and Holy Week, Passover week. It would be one of the last miracles that he performed. He healed blind Bartimaeus and he raised Lazarus from the dead, which was not only a physical thing that happened, but it was a, it was a spiritual picture of resurrection to come. And so Jesus tarried four days, but when he showed up, Jesus was on time. Now, in Job's case, while these three friends cared and they loved him, they obviously are going to, when they open their mouths, they're going to speak foolishly for the most part. A second advice that we could give to friends is friends 
respond with empathy and comfort. Friends, respond with empathy and comfort. I found out this. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Hello, are y'all out there? If you don't know what to say, the best thing that I learned in a master's class of counseling in grief and bereavement counseling was this. Hug them and hush. Hug and hush. Hug and hush. Because if you say the wrong thing, you may think you're saying the right thing, but I can assure you, based upon the many hours that I've spent with people down through the years, they will always remember the thing that offended them, the thing that hurt them the most. And so when you don't know what to say, Don't say, oh, that person is better off. Sure, they're better off. But you're not better off because you still want them here. And so we say all of the idiotic, stupid things because we feel we've got to respond and we don't know how to respond, so we say the wrong thing. So the answer to that is hug them and hush. The hug says everything if you don't know what to say. Now, now I'm saying this to you because I have said idiotic things before. So I understand fully and completely what I'm trying to say here tonight. But real friends, when they really truly think, put yourself in the crucible of the person that you're fixing to visit or the person that is going through whatever they're going through. Put yourself in their position. What would you want people to say to you? Try as best you can, but remember the excruciating pain that is going through their minds. And oftentimes people will say, the thing I remember most is what my best friend said. And it hurt me, and it offended me, and I've never forgotten it. John Hartley says this, on learning of Job's affliction, three beloved friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they agreed together to travel to Uz in order to console Job. The term for friends has a wide range of meanings, including an intimate counselor, a close friend, a party in a legal dispute. Friends often solemnize their relationship with the covenant promising to care for each other under all kinds of circumstances. The relationship between Job and his three friends gives every evidence of being based on a covenant. Such a relationship was characterized by loyal love, motivated by love and their commitment. These men came to console and to comfort Job. The word to console means literally to shake the head or to rock the body back and forth as a sign of shared grief. To comfort is to attempt to ease the deepest pain caused by a tragedy or death. With the noblest intentions, these three earnestly desired to help Job bear his sorrow. Now, that's what they really, really intended to do. But weigh your words. Listen to your words before you speak your words. Thirdly, advice to friends. Friends openly express the depth of their feelings. You see, just casual friends don't usually do that, but genuine friends do. Genuine friends openly express the depth of their feelings. I'm reminded of a little girl one day who was walking down the street from school. She saw another little girl sitting on some steps, and the little girl was weeping and crying. And she held her doll close to her. The little girl stopped to see if she could be of any assistance. And in that particular moment of grief of that child, the little girl, other little girl came home and her mother asked her, why are you late today? And she said, mommy, while I was walking home from school, I saw another little girl sitting on some steps and she was holding her doll and she was weeping and crying loudly. And her mother said, well, honey, how on earth did you help her? She said, I just sat down and started crying with her. 
You see, tears are a language that only God understands. Tears are a language that speak volumes in situations. I read today where the Queen of England sat isolated by herself yesterday at Prince uh, Philip's funeral, her husband of 73 years, I believe it was, 71 years. And, uh, of course, what do the investigative journalists do? They begin to pick her apart. What a tragic, critical, cruel world we live in. They finally decided she wiped a tear away as she was getting in the car to leave. You know, we live in such a critical, critical, cruel world. Must I tell you, not everybody grieves alike. Have you wondered why some people can grieve buckets of tears and other people are very stoic? And in their stoicism, they're dying on the inside. They just are not an outward, extroverted type of person that expresses their grief. Everybody does not grieve alike. Some people will do strange things. When grief happens, I've seen it through the years. People do all kinds of strange events. I remember when the Oklahoma City bombing happened. Many of you remember that. And then there were three uh, 13-year-olds here in Duncan that were blown up just up there beyond stage stand. Many of you remember that. Some people came to me and said, would you please do a grief? Would you do a grief group? There are so many problems that are going on. And I can remember I started that. Now, I've learned since that you're better off to have smaller groups. But in that 12-week period of time that I did that, once a week, there were some 120, 130 people that were in that grief group. I had people that one of their family members was murdered. They knew who did it. They couldn't pin it on them. The body was found in an airport parking lot in Florida. And they were living through the grief of knowing that it was done, perpetrated upon the victim, and yet that person, they couldn't, they couldn't pin it on them. There were people in the Oklahoma City bombing. I had some of those people, family members, in my grief group. In fact, one of my cousins had just left the social security office there in the um, uh, government building of the Murrah building. He had just left to run an errand when that exploded and blew up. I had two of the three parents of those three young men that were blown up here in town on that Sunday afternoon riding their bi bicycles innocently and a spark sparks the tank and it blows up and three little boys were basically incinerated on that day. I had all kinds of people that came through that, and I don't mind to tell you, this is truth. I have never recovered from that group some 30-something years ago. It played a incredible, incredible thing upon my mind. I remember vividly one lady in her late 70s, who shared with us in group that day. She said, my little brother, we grew up on a farm. He was killed in a tractor accident on our farm on that day. She said, I was just a little girl. She said, we buried my little brother that next afternoon. That's the way they did back in those days. She said, we were never allowed to speak his name ever again in our house or at the table. She said, what I have learned in all of my 70 plus years of living that my own daughters have told me because of my own unresolved grief issues from that day on the farm of my little brother's horrible, heinous, tragic accident, I carried my unresolved grief issues with me through life, 
And I did not know that I had damaged my own three daughters. And they shared with me the problems that existed in their own lives because of my own unresolved grief issues. I can only imagine when you look at Job, when you look at Mrs. Job, I can only imagine the grief issues. He is doing his best to keep his integrity intact. She wants him just to curse God and die now that he's lost it all. Possessions, ten children, seven sons, three daughters, servants, all of his stock, all of his wealth, and then his health went. She wasn't grieving on the same level that he's grieving on. They are grieving on different pages. Please understand that the statistics prove and the science that backs it up proves that some 75 to 80, and it may even be beyond that, percent of people who lose children wind up in divorce. Let me tell you, it's the minority of those people that are in a club all their own. You and I don't know how they feel, contrary to what we think. You may have lost a mother. You may have lost a spouse. You may have lost a sibling. You may have lost your best friend. But folks, let me tell you, until you sit in the driver's seat of where the person has lost what they've lost, there is no way you and I can identify with them. I've often stood at funeral services and spoken to family members and said, I have sat where you are sitting If I'm doing a father's funeral or a mother's funeral, I've lost a mother, I've lost a father. I don't know what you're feeling today, but I know some of what I felt. So therefore, my heart goes out to you. You see, so oftentimes in life, friends mean well, but friends come up gravely short. I've had people in counseling that have said to me, I walked into the grocery store and I saw one of my best friends and as soon as they spotted me, they turned and went down another aisle. You know why? They don't know what to say. And so they don't confront. They just fade into the background. They don't know what to do. In the case of a divorce, A divorce is a grief. It's an incredible grief. Because if it's a bitter one, you always have the opportunity of seeing that person again somewhere. Lots of people don't understand that's a grief. Let me tell you, kids that have had abortions later experience great psychological issues in life. Those unresolved grief issues that they have. Men and women both who lose parts of their body to accidents or to cancer. That's a grief in itself. It's a loss. And losses are grieved. Let me tell you, as they stood there and looked at Job, I mean, obviously his hair has gone. There were boils, the Bible says, from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, or from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. Obviously, he would even take a piece of pottery and break it, a potsherd, a piece of pottery to scrape those sores that oozed and ran pus. I hope none of you are fixing to go eat. Uh, And and as they itched, he would scratch those. Can you only imagine? And they seem, and, and they, they can't even begin to imagine. And so they pick up dust and they throw it over their heads. It was an ancient expression of grief. And I'm sure they cried. I'm sure they sat down on the ground, verse 13 says. But let me tell you, friends don't mind getting dirty and messy if they're really true friends. I like that song that says friends are friends forever if the Lord's the Lord of them and a friend will not say never. 
though the welcome will not end. It's hard to let them go to the Father's hands, we know, but a lifetime's not too long to live as friends. A fourth thing friends do, genuine friends aren't turned off by distasteful sights. Distasteful sights. Friends are not offended because the room has a foul smell. I learned a long time ago in visiting people in the nursing home, visiting people in the hospitals, I have walked in on situations I'm sure that were embarrassing to the person that was there. I learned a long time ago, and, and Dan Pruitt taught me this lesson. When I used to go to the hospital with him, Dan would already be out of a room before I could get to the room. That's how quick he moved. But I learned something very valuable about that. When you go, people don't want you to linger. Some people sit down and, and camp. And uh, I, I learned a long time ago, you don't know what the person is experiencing. You don't know what medicine they've been given, that they may need to be in privacy. And I've learned the best thing to do is go in. So if you're there and I come to see you, my visits aren't long. I move pretty quickly because I'm smart enough to know you're there for a reason. And you just might not want me to be in the room if something happened. I remember when my mother was taking chemotherapy. And uh, when I was growing up, I always had a weak stomach. I still have a weak stomach. If you ever start to gag in my sight, I will be heaving on the ground. Me and David Burham one time went over to a senior adult's house years ago. When we were over across town, we went over to try to help her clean out her icebox. And both of us wound up out in the yard on our knees, gagging and trying to throw up. And she got offended at us. I tried to tell her, hey, I'm sorry, I have a weak stomach, you know. So learn a lesson. Friends aren't turned off by distasteful sights. I mean, after all, those people that are there, they didn't desire to be lying in a bed with waste. They didn't desire that. That would not have been what they would have chosen in life. Number five, true friends understand, so they say very little. Warren Wiersbe said the best way to help people who are hurting is just to be with them saying little or nothing and letting them know you care. Don't try to explain everything. Explanations never heal a broken heart. If Job's friends had listened to him, if they would have accepted his feelings and not argued with him, they would have helped him greatly, but they chose to be the prosecuting attorneys instead of witnesses. And so, after the seven days, these friends, they begin to pour out all of their criticism upon Job. So tonight, what I would say from verses 11 and 13 about friends, just remember Whenever you go and you're not sitting in the driver's seat of where that person is sitting, explanations are usually useless. They are usually offensive. And so I say, hug people. Let them know you love them. And beyond that, that says it all. Joe Bailey writes in a book, he lost three of he and his wife's children. They lost one son following surgery when he was just 18 days old. They lost a second boy at the age of five because of leukemia. And then they lost a third at the age of 18 years old after a sledding accident because of complications that he had to being a hemophiliac. He had a blood disorder that he bled easily and profusely. Joe Bailey wrote a book called the view from a hearse. I've read that book. They later changed the title to The Last Things That We Talk About. And Joe Bailey says this, and I'm through. I was sitting, torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings 
of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved, except I wished he'd go away. He finally did. Another came and sat down beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He was just beside me for an hour and more. He listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply, left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see that friend go. Would you bow with me as we pray tonight? Father, thank you for the life lessons from the book of Job. Thank you for the lessons we learn from Job's wife. The lessons we learn as men from Job himself and the way he is anchor held in spite of the storm. Thank you that we learn from these friends, oh God, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what helps, what hurts, what hinders. God, help us to take and apply these life principles to our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen.